times in our lives that we make deals, and luckily we don't have to wear strange costumes and guess behind what's curtain number one or number two or number three, and end up with a, I think it's a wong, whatever they do, some kind of crazy noise that makes sure they everyone knows that they lost. But a deal that I always feel like I end up losing is when I go buy a new car, or even a used car. Do we have any car salesmen here? No? Well, for the millions of car salesmen, you know, that are watching online, um, I, I, I'm not here to, you know, rip on them. I'm sure there are some honest ones out there. But every time I walk out of those places, I, I just feel like I'm completely getting ripped off because there's, there's always a new bottle. There's always an extra sale that can take place. And they present it to me like it, it's some favor that they're doing for me by knocking the price a little bit. But... I don't know a lot about cars. I don't know what it actually costs to deliver that car or make that car, so I, I never know if I'm getting a good deal or not. And I, I fall for that too at grocery stores. Go out to the grocery store and see a sale right at the front, you know, strawberries two for five dollars. And I think, well, I gotta buy these strawberries because they're on sale. But then the next week when I buy strawberries for five dollars a pound, I think, am I double paying for strawberries what they actually cost? So it's just there's something within us that, that doesn't want to be ripped off. That, that wants to have a good deal, no matter what we're buying. Right? That always, doesn't want to have to sit down at a table with somebody that we don't trust and, and have to continually walk away from that deal trying to get a better price. Like the used car salesman where you walk away and they say, Oh, I can make it a thousand dollars lower because you're a pastor. So you get the community leader discount. And then you stand up and walk away again. And they say, oh, this is on this weekend, you know, on the 10th week of Pentecost, you also get another $1,000 off. Or you stand up and walk away again and say, oh, if you have an aunt that lives in California, you get the golden ant package as well. And it just completely lowers and lowers and lowers. And you never know what the good deal is. You never know when you can be confident you got all you deserve for what you put in to that situation. Now, in our lesson for today, we're talking about deals and covenants that are made between the children of Israel and between God. And clearly, God is not a used car salesman. Okay, God is someone that offers us deals and offers us covenants and these contracts that are the best that we could ever have. This is a picture, this is Mount Sinai, uh, below it, that's St. Catherine's Monastery. Uh, it's a monastery that's been there since 3rd century AD, I think. It has one of the oldest versions of the Bible called the Codex Sinaiticus. Not that you need to know that, just kind of an interesting fact. But the, the children of Israel were there, and they made a covenant with God. This is not the first covenant that God had made with the Israelites. If we go back to Abraham, right? Genesis chapter 15, there's, there's a, uh, an account in there that we don't go over very often in Sunday school. And they don't even know how often it shows up that our three-year liturgy plans. Uh, but God makes a covenant with Abraham. And this flaming torch passes through these number of different sacrifices. Promising that God is going to keep his promise to Abraham. And in that account, that account, this is God saying to Abraham, this is what I'm going to do for you. This is a one-sided promise. I'm going to be your God. You are going to be my people. Normally, we think when we think of Abraham, the promise of the, the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore and making his nation great and numerous and all nations on earth being blessed through him. But it really started out in that Genesis chapter 15 account. Now here, when we get to Genesis chapter 24, the, the children of Israel had just been rescued from Egypt. It's like they'd taken a test drive with God. You know, they, they'd seen how powerful he is, that he can drive out any nation, that he can part seas, that he can make those seas destroy any armies that are there. And he lays out to the people in Exodus 23, the chapter just before, what he's going to do for them. He says that he's going to drive, will send his terror ahead of them. Throw into confusion every nation you encounter. Have all the enemies turn their back and run. Send the hornet, um, 
recorded this, the, the angel of the Lord, basically, in front of them to drive out all these other nations. He tells the people after these verses that he's not going to do it all in one swoop. Okay, he's not just going to send a, a hurricane to wipe out all the people. But he's going to do it slowly in stages, so that as the people conquer the land, the food will still be there. They're going to have vineyards that will still be maintained. They'll, they'll still have fields of agriculture. They can live in these homes that they didn't build and harvest crops that they didn't plant. Um, he tells them that the, the borders that he's going to establish, how big Israel's going to be from the, the Jordan all the way to the Mediterranean Sea, even before they start to have these battles, even before they spy on the people and learn how powerful they're going to be. God tells them clearly, this is what I'm going to do for you. This is my side of the covenant that I'm going to take care of. I mean, that's the deal. That's the deal that God makes with them. And then the deal from the other side, what the children of Israel are supposed to do in response to God's promise, is found in Exodus 20 to the first half of 23, which is the Ten Commandments. And then it also includes a uh, civil law that God gives. So what you do if someone steals land, what you do if someone uh, accidentally kills someone else, what you do if people are being unjust, how to take care of the nation, talks about the different festivals that God wants them to celebrate and worship. And God says, keep these laws. Keep these commands. If you do this, if you obey me, if you listen to me, I will be your God, you will be my people, you will live in this land in peace and prosperity and all the promises that I made to Abraham about blessing your nation, having the Savior come through line, are going to be kept. Then God sweetens the deal. After they had already made this promise, God allows the leaders of the Israelites to see him, brings them up. Now, I think a lot of times when we, when we teach this in Sunday school, or even when it's taught in church, we think of Moses, right? Moses is the one that goes up on Mount Sinai. Moses is the one that goes up and with Joshua for 40 days and sees the Ten Commandments and all the different things that are up there. But the children of Israel, they're, they're left out there. There's a separation between God and his people, between the one who is holy and all of those who are sinful. But in our account today from Exodus chapter 24, there's communion with everyone. The people hear the commands that God has said, they, they hear the deal that God gives to them, they say, yes, we will obey it, we're going to take this deal. And Moses unites them together. He has this sacrifice where half of the blood is put on the altar of the Lord. Half of the blood is put on the people. The sacrifice of these animals connects God and his people together. And they are allowed to see the Lord. To be in his presence. God calls up 70 elders. Nadab and Abihu who are Aaron's sons, who are high priests at that time. Aaron, who is the chief high priest, and Moses. And they get to stand in front of the Lord and eat and drink in his presence. And it's not that their sins just magically disappear. But it is God saying to them, I will be your God, and I will not look upon you as sin. Because of the sacrifice that has taken place, you can stand in the presence of God. You can see Him. I just kind of want to go off on a tangent for a second, because it's just kind of a fascinating thing, that God is standing on this lapis lazuli. And I really wish Paul and Janet Cox were here. Uh, they're part of the Reno Rock Hounds, which is a, another group I just learned about, but... Uh, they know a lot about gemstones and rocks, but lapis lazuli is, it's a sapphire, okay? It's, it's the earliest form of sapphire. It was very, very uh, special to the ancient Near East culture and those people at that time. 
It was mined by heating up rocks and throwing cold water on it so the rocks would split apart and they take this. Uh, when you look at cultures of that time, they, they, they saw it as a rock of the divinity. Okay, when you think of like Egyptian art, that blue that's in the Egyptian art, that's lapis lazuli. Cleopatra's eyeshadow, that, you know, blue, that's ground up lapis lazuli that's put on her at that time. But this, this rock that is there, it, it really, it's, it's a blue rock with iron pyrite, which is fool's gold, and white crystals, all in this metamorphic rock that's together that's found in the Middle East. And the Jewish people from this time forward, this blue and white and gold, that's what becomes their nation's colors. The, the idea of God being eternal, blue, this, this color of heaven, gold being the symbol of divinity, white being this, this color of, of purity. It's found on their flag, it's found on their prayer shawls, it is everywhere in their life, this royal, incredible blue color that all goes back to this lesson here of where God, what it looked like when God was standing in the presence of his people. Okay, enough of that tangent. So these people are here. They're standing in front of God. They are worshiping him. They are honoring and praising him. And then Moses goes up. Moses goes up and receives the Ten Commandments. And I don't know if they were written on the lapis lazuli stone. A lot of times, you know, it's pictured as just rock, but maybe it was on this. But anyway, they go up there, and how long did it take? 40 days. 40 days between the leaders of Israel seeing God face to face, to Aaron collecting gold from the people, and building a golden calf. 40 days from saying, yes, we will obey you, God, we'll do whatever you say, to saying, maybe God's not going to help us. Maybe God's not going to be there in our lives. Maybe we should find some other deal that's out there to worship and praise our God. And I, I, don't, I don't think this is a big jump in our lives. That there are so many times that we, we see God. Not, not, you know, standing on this blue sapphire stone, but we see our prayers answered. We, we see his hand directing us in our life on a path that we never thought we would go down. But we see why he made us go down that path. We, we, we see our sins forgiven. We, we see God holding us close and comforting us and protecting us. And we, we feel so excited. And yes, we'll do everything the Lord says. And then within a matter of hours or days, all of a sudden we're worshiping another God. We're looking for another deal. Where we're looking for something else in this world that offers us something God doesn't. It's just in our nature. It's in our nature to think that somehow God is withholding from us. There's someone out there that can give us a better deal if we would only not look to our God, but look to ourselves and the people around us, whoever's promising us something else. There isn't a better deal in this world than full and free forgiveness of sins, protection from an almighty God, and everlasting life. That is what your God gives to you. And he doesn't require you to come to the negotiating table and stand up and walk away to get that deal. He's the one that found you. He's the one that provided all of the goods. He's the one that sets it in front of you and says, this is yours. Just go walk away from this table. Sit here. Eat and drink with me. Be strengthened. Be in your, my word and see what I am giving to you. Don't stray from the Lord. Every other person that is trying to offer you something else, that is trying to convince you that your God can't do what they can do for you, they're 
They're always going to pull off the floor from beneath you. They, they are far worse than a used car salesman or tax collector. They are trying to take from you what your God freely gives. What your God promises to you in a one-way promise. You have life. You have faith. You have peace. You have comfort. You have security. And you're going to have that every single day of your life until the day when you stand in front of the Lord in the sea of lapis lazuli, as it says in Revelation, and just get to enjoy the riches and treasures that your God has been waiting to give you fully. Don't walk away. This is the best deal you could ever receive. Take it. Amen. The peace of our God that surpasses all understanding will guard our hearts and our minds through salvation in Christ Jesus. Amen. I invite you to please rise. We'll continue by praising our God with the 